it's two meetings on uh, on MIC. And uh, with regard to the list of speakers under Rule 37, the presidency took note of the fact that all these requests came from foreign ministers who took the time to travel to New York to be at the United Nations on this anniversary. This clearly indicates that they feel that their countries have been and are still being directly impacted by this war. The agenda is adopted. I would like to warmly welcome the Secretary General and the distinguished ministers and other high-level representatives. Your presence today underscores the importance of the subject matter under discussion. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representatives of Croatia, Czech, Estonia, Germany, Hungary, Italy, Latvia, Netherlands, North Macedonia, Poland, Republic of Moldova, Romania, Slovakia, Spain, and Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite His Excellency Mr. Josep Borrell, High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of Item 2 of the Agenda. And I now give the floor to the Secretary General, His Excellency Mr. Antonio Gutierrez. Mr. President, Excellencies, the purposes and principles embedded in the United Nations Charter are not a matter of convenience. They are not merely words on paper. They are at the core of who we are. And they reflect the driving mission of our United Nations. And they exist precisely to address any grievance, whatever it may be. One year ago, I sat in this Council and urged, and I quote, in the name of humanity, do not allow to start in Europe what could be the worst war since the beginning of the century, with consequences not only devastating for Ukraine, not only tragic for the Russian Federation, but with an impact we cannot even foresee in relation to the consequences for the global economy. End of quote. I said then that we must give peace a chance, but peace has had no chance. War has ruled the day. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is a blatant violation of the United Nations Charter and international law. It has unleashed widespread deaths, destruction, and displacement. Attacks on civilian and civilian infrastructure have caused many casualties and terrible suffering. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has documented dozens of cases of conflict-related sexual violence against men, women, and girls, and serious violations of international humanitarian and human rights law against prisoners of war and hundreds of cases of enforced disappearances and arbitrary detentions of civilians were also documented. Mr. President, life is a living hell for the people of Ukraine. An estimated 17.6 million people, nearly 40% of the population of Ukraine, require humanitarian assistance and protection. The crisis has erased 30% of pre-war jobs. The World Food Programme estimates that nearly 40% of Ukrainians are unable to afford or access enough food. And the war has sparked a displacement crisis not seen in Europe in decades. More than 8 million Ukrainian refugees have been recorded across Europe, in addition to an estimated 5.4 million who have been internally displaced. More than half of all Ukrainian children have been forced from their homes with unaccompanied and separated children facing grave risks of violence, abuse and exploitation. Vital infrastructure is under fire. Water, energy and heating systems have been destroyed in the depths of a freezing winter. 
The World Health Organization has verified over 700 attacks on healthcare facilities, and more than 3,000 schools and colleges have been damaged or destroyed. Millions of students have had their education severely disrupted. Less measurable, but no less important, is the devastating impact of months of displacement and bombardment on the mental health of Ukrainians. Nearly 10 million people, including 7.8 million children, are at risk of acute post-traumatic stress disorder. And make no mistake, the Russian Federation is also suffering the deadly consequences. Mr. President. Mr. President, we need peace peace in line with the United Nations Charter and international law. As we work for peace, we will continue calling for action on many fronts. Protection of civilians must remain the top priority. Attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure must stop. The use of explosive weapons with wide area effects in populated areas in towns, cities and villages must end. Safe and unimpeded humanitarian access for life-saving assistance must be ensured. We must also invest in Ukraine's recovery and reconstruction. At the request of the Ukrainian government and on behalf of the United Nations system, the United Nations Development Program is co-leading an assessment of damage to energy infrastructure jointly with the World Bank. Mr. President, since the start of the war, the International Atomic Energy Agency has supported Ukraine to ensure the safety and security of its 15 operating reactors at four nuclear plants, including Europe's largest nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia. We continue to urge all parties to swiftly agree and implement a nuclear safety and security protection zone at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant to avoid a serious accident with potentially disastrous consequences. Barely veiled threats to use nuclear weapons in the context of the conflict have spiked nuclear risks to levels not seen since the darkest days of the Cold War. These threats are unacceptable. Progress continues to be made under the Black Sea Grain Initiative, an agreement brokered with the parties by the United Nations and the government of Turkey. More than 20 million metric tons of foodstuffs have now been safely reconnected to global supply chains on more than 700 ships helping to bring down prices around the world. I want to underscore the importance of all parties remaining engaged in this initiative and reiterate our call for it to be extended beyond March 2023. And the United Nations is firmly committed to working to remove remaining obstacles to Russian food and fertilizer exports, including ammonia. These exports are essential to our broader efforts to bring down prices and this food insecurity around the globe. Both efforts demonstrate that international cooperation is essential, valuable and possible, even in the midst of conflict. Mr. President, over the past year, this Council has held more than 40 debates on Ukraine. The Ghanas are talking now, but in the end, we know, we all know, that the path of diplomacy and accountability is the road to a just and sustainable peace. Peace in line with UN Charter, international law, and yesterday's resolution of the General Assembly. We must prevent further escalation. We must all encourage every meaningful effort to end the bloodshed and, at long last, give peace a chance. Thank you. I thank the Secretary General for his briefing, and I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Dmitry Kuleba, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. Mr. President, Distinguished members of the Security Council, Secretary General. First of all, I would like to thank the Presidency of Malta for convening this important meeting. The General Assembly has just passed a resolution on the principles of comprehensive, just, and lasting peace in Ukraine. 141 member states took the side of the UN Charter, while seven took the side of Russia. No additional explanations are required here. The resolution follows the logic of President Zelensky's peace formula. The goal of this 10-point plan is to restore respect for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. In full compliance with the UN Charter 
that we all have committed to respect and uphold. To make it short, the goal of the plan is to get Russia out of Ukraine and make the world a safer place. Obviously, any new peace proposals should now be aligned with demands set forth by the resolution. We invite all countries from every corner of the world to facilitate implementation of the resolution and the peace formula. We need to act jointly and quickly. To ensure nuclear safety and security, by forcing Russia to withdraw from the illegally occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and stopping missile attacks that endanger nuclear power plants across the territory of Ukraine. To avoid the threat of hunger, by furthering the Black Sea Grain Initiative and countering Russian efforts to undermine it, as well as by developing our Grain from Ukraine Initiative. To prevent an energy crisis which will require the cessation of Russian missile terror against critical infrastructure of Ukraine. To protect the environment as the Russian shelling that burned millions of hectares of Ukrainian forests threatens our efforts to counter global warming. But first and foremost, people must be saved. Their lives and their rights are at the center of our struggle for peace. The magnitude of the humanitarian crisis brought on by Russia's aggression against Ukraine cannot be overstated. I would like to highlight here only one of numerous horrendous facts. Russia is now implementing in Ukraine probably the largest instance of state-sponsored kidnapping of children in history of our modern world. Dear members of the Council, Ukraine will resist as it has done so far, and Ukraine will win. Putin is going to lose much sooner than he thinks. Here is what Russian officials and servicemen have to know. You think you would get away with what you did? No. You will end up on trial. You will be testifying how strongly you were opposed to the aggression and how you just followed orders. You think that the world will get tired of supporting Ukraine? The support will only get stronger. You think that Ukraine will eventually tire of defending itself? The more, the more and the longer you will keep attacking Ukraine, the more resolve we will have and the more humiliating your defeat will be. Dear colleagues, Russian propaganda has fabricated this hypocritical narrative that supplying Ukraine with weapons fuels the war. Ukraine indeed needs weapons, just as a firefighter needs water to extinguish a fire, the fire that is destroying your home and killing innocent people. The sooner and the more we get, the sooner the fire will be extinguished. Arming a country that defends itself from the aggression is absolutely legitimate and is an act of defending the UN Charter. On the contrary, helping an aggressor is illegitimate and defies the Charter. Any supply of weapons or military equipment to Russia means complicity in the trampling of the UN Charter. If you give weapons to Russia, you commit a crime. In the short term, Ukraine needs to restore its sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. And in the long run, justice must be served. The Nuremberg International Military Tribunal's verdict was crystal clear. War of aggression is not only a war crime. It is the supreme international crime distinguishing itself from other war crimes only in that it contains the accumulated evil, evil of the whole. This is why we call for the establishment of the special tribunal with specific jurisdiction over the crime of aggression against Ukraine and the ability to deal with personal immunities of principal perpetrators of this crime. The geography of Russian crimes against international peace and security goes far beyond the borders of Ukraine and reaches Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Russia not only incites conflicts, but also systemically obstructs UN Security Council decisions needed to resolve them. 
Today, Russia argued that this Council is overly focused on Ukraine and ignores problems of the rest of the world. Let us all remember the truth. Russia is the problem of the world. I open the UN Charter that I have here in front of me, and I do not see the words, member states can attack other member states at their will, end of quote. I don't see the words, violating borders is allowed. And furthermore, and most importantly, I do not see the words, the Russian Federation in the UN Charter on the list of permanent Security Council members. In 1991, Russia usurped the USSR seat of the Permanent Security Council member and turned it into the throne of impunity. The future of Russia in the United Nations should be determined in the context of the illegitimate change of plates from USSR to Russia in 1991 and responsibility for crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine, including war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. I say it again and again, peace means justice. And all the peace-loving nations will win peace on the battlefield and at the diplomatic tables. Finally, on this tragic day, when we mourn lives and destinies broken by Russia, I kindly ask everyone to observe a minute of silence in memory of the victims of the aggression. I thank you, Mr. President. The representative of the Russian Federation has asked for the floor to make a statement. Mr. President, we are getting up on our feet to honor the memory of all victims of what has happened in